Let me start with showing you a teaser list of the three. Number three is the universal Buddhahood. This is grounded in the sutra's famous teaching of one vehicle. And what is great about this teaching is that Buddhahood reverses your experience of time. And let me talk more about this in a second. Number two is Buddhist temples are no longer necessary because temples are usually necessary, right, for our practice. But what does saying no longer necessary mean? Number one, the most neglected and yet mind-blowing symbolism. I want you to make sure to reach this part, which is going to expand the power of your creative imagination about what's really going on in the Lotus Sutra. With that in mind, are you ready? Three, two, one, let's go! In the Lotus Sutra, becoming a Buddha means to fully understand and accept who you are. The Sutra says, if you hear even the one verse of the Sutra and give rise to joy, you will become a Buddha. What is interesting here is that Buddhahood reverses the time that you experience. From the viewpoint of having already accomplished a Buddhahood, you will retrospectively realize, oh, okay, all the moments in the past during which you are unenlightened are an expression of your Buddhahood unbeknownst to you. I love this wisdom of the Lotus Sutra because imagining that I've been the Buddha unbeknownst to me is uplifting and is such an unexpected discovery about the truth of my life. But it also makes me wonder, how can I be a Buddha with all of my delusions and attachments? This question is super important because in the Lotus Sutra, Buddhahood is not about excluding your personal problems, but rather it's all about fully understanding and accepting your delusions and attachments. In other words, Buddhahood is not about ignoring your problems, but rather is a mastery of all delusions and attachments. That is a thorough comprehension of the nature of the tendency of your mind. But then the further important question is to ask, where in the Lotus Sutra can we find that implication? Oh, did you have the same question? Excellent. That's in chapter 4, for instance, where four elder Shravakas exactly demonstrate this experience. So for many years of practice, they were really anxious about their spiritual destiny. But as the chapter says here in the Shakyamuni's declaration that all Shravakas are Bodhisattvas, they embrace this message and give rise to joy. So this was their moment of fully understanding the nature of being a Shravaka and accepting that as a part of their Bodhisattva practice. So from the enlightened eyes, all these struggles are part of their Buddhahood. So the Lotus Sutra is really an interesting text, right? Because the Buddhahood there is not about eternally calming your mind, but it's rather like actively mastering all of your delusions and attachments. That's the number three mind-blowing wisdom of the Lotus Sutra. Let's go to number two. As soon as you have this awareness about your true self, according to the Lotus Sutra, you will no longer need to build monasteries or temples as a site for your Buddhist practice. But why is that the case? Let's take a look at how the Sutra says about this. Chapter 17 says, These good sons and good daughters have no need to erect stupas, temples, or monasteries for me because they are already erecting for the Buddha's relics, stupas, or the precious seven. Indeed, they have already been making these offerings for innumerable thousands of millions of kalpas. What does it mean that you are already erecting stupas and Buddhist training sites and so no longer need to build them? I think this is saying that the external buildings and monasteries and temples are no longer necessary because once you have this internal realization, the entire world that you spend your time becomes a site of your Buddhist training and practice. Of course, going to the Sunday services, going to meditation sessions and so on are important. So the message here is to let's get over the distinction you make between, okay, from here to there, now is the time for Buddhist practice. And once we get out of there, you forget about it and just, you know, be a slave of your desires and delusions and so on. Let's try to extend the training ground into every single bit of your experience in your everyday life. And you know what? You can practice like that in the modern world today by joining my Buddhist community called Richard Kosekai. And you can find your local Dharma Center through the link in the description or join the online Sangha called Arkina. All right, folks, finally, number one, flower symbolism. Flower symbolism is probably unexpected to you 
because this is one of the most neglected elements in the Lotus Sutra. But nevertheless, flowers appear throughout the Buddhist literature. So for instance, in chapter 17 again, there's a verse section that says, By string flowers, incense and perfume powders, and constantly burning the fragrant oils of smana, champaka, and atimuktaka flowers, those who make such offerings will gain a measurable merit, just as space is boundless, so too are their merits. Do you see that it says smana, champaka, and atimuktaka? These are the names of flowers offered to the Buddha as an expression of gratitude and admiration for his achievement and teaching. But you may wonder why these particular flowers are offered. Is that okay to offer a tulip to the Buddha in a home altar instead of champaka flower? Yes, it is. Because what matters the most for our lay Buddhist practice is the purity of our heart. So any flower offering can be an excellent practice. But today, let's take a deeper dive into the symbolism of Champaka flower. The Champaka flower looks like this. This flower is known for having strong, sweet aroma and it has an amazing, amazing Buddhist story behind it. Like in, today in India, there is a city called Pagalpur. I don't know how to pronounce it. But in an old time, this city was called Champa. This name was taken from Champaka tree, strikingly. According to the Buddhist Pali Canon, historical Buddha visited this place. For instance, Diga Nikaya has a story of the Brahmin Sonadanda and the Buddha Shakyamuni. One day, Sonadanda, who was a wealthy teacher of many students, heard that Shakyamuni was visiting and staying at the banks of the Gakkara's Lotus Lake and thought of visiting him. But his students tried to stop him because they think that the Buddha rather should come to their master, Sonadanda. But he convinced his students and together with them, they all went to visit the Buddha. But on their way to where the Buddha was staying, Sonadanda suddenly had a sort of anxiety attack, thinking, what if I ended up not being able to speak well in front of the Buddha and all of my students. Am I gonna be embarrassed and my students will make me make fun of me? Knowing this anxiety over potential embarrassment, upon their arrival, Shakyamuni said to Sonadanda, Ah, let me stop here. Let me not ruin your experience of reading this story. So let me link the story in the description box below and let me know how you think about this in the comment. Especially pay attention to the anxiety of the feelings of the the master, after reading and enjoying that story, every time you see Champaka word in the Lotus Sutra, your creative imagination will be mind-blowing.